Well, hi, hi everybody Mark. and welcome to birth talk today we are talking with susan and we're going to talk about how to cope with labor so we wanted to start this 20 minutes ago but guess what sometimes labor is like that isn't it labor doesn't start when you when you want it when you expect it when you plan for it when you think so isn't that the irony of of us getting started just a little bit late but hey so welcome hi susan hi you're the sound quality is so bad from what I hear what's coming from you. So I don't know if you can hear me well or not. I can hear you clearly and I'm going to increase my volume. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Yeah. It's not volume. It's just the reception. It's okay. messing up the voice quality, but so hopefully it's okay on your end. My end is crystal clear. So this is great. And uh, I know Susan had to get onto a, a phone device rather than a laptop to make this happen. So I'm glad we made it happen because this is a great topic. And I'd love to hear you share with us. When, I, when we talked about doing another session, you said, hey, let's talk about how to cope with labor. And you definitely have ideas to share on seven labors that you've had. And can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how to hold the camera. Sorry. All right. All right. Well, that might be uh, your hardship. So, <laughs> um, uh, so you can share with us your labor. And I had many different ideas pop in my head. I'd like to share various ideas throughout the conversation, uh, little tips and pointers because I've had six births and all of my labors, well, five of my labors were three hours or less. My pushing stage was just a natural like ejac ejaculation or ejection where I didn't really have to strain and push so hard. And I've had minimal pain. So I feel like I can share many good pointers um, with women who are ready to go into labor and um, I guess, uh, what's the, what's the first thing that strikes you about labor? How do you cope with labor? Well, the first thing for me is I think you have to have a foundation of, um, how to overcome the fear. Mm -hmm. I think the number one thing that um, interferes with labor, complicates labor, makes it be overwhelmingly painful, and also interferes with progression is fear. Okay. And when I was studying on how to, um, to make my birth not be overwhelmingly painful, mm -hmm. to, just to recap, I have seven kids. Mm -hmm. The first two were born in the hospital with nurse midwives, and the last five were born at home. Um, and my first two, although they were, sorry, I'm trying to, I want to get, okay, there. Um, although the first two labors were natural in the sense they were vaginal and they were intervention free, I was overwhelmed. I had said in our previous segment that I felt like I was uh, like a little girl. I was crying out for other people to help me and to take my pain away. And um, I just didn't feel like birth was needed to be that way. I just felt like something was missing. I didn't know what it was and that I, I could birth better. So and why were you crying out in pain? Were you crying out because you thought that's what the culture told us what labor was? Or did you actually feel that from the inside? Well, I just, I was suffering. I was hurting and I was um, scared and I was not um, like versed in in how labor progresses I guess I I just was terrified by the pain and and I tried with my first birth I tried the Lamaze breathing I had wanted to do um, take a Bradley class husband coach childbirth class and I couldn't afford it and the Lamaze was free so I took Lamaze and I tried the breathing and I hyperventilated and that only made things worse. Yeah. So then I studied um, Bradley uh, more with my second one. I was able to do the breathing and the relaxation a little better, but mm -hmm. just what was really the key was um, 
in my with my third birth, I had come across Laura Shanley's birth, unassisted childbirth. Okay. And in her book, she speaks heavily about the influence of fear and how it affects our nervous system, the the side of our nervous system that affects the flight or fight response. Good. And um, and she, her work is based off of Grantly Dick Reed's book, mm -hmm. Childbirth Without Fear. Right. And so that is very, um, you know, just the basis, the basic building block is we need to overcome fear that that's that introduced that idea to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Laura had her um, her book talks about overcoming fear. And what I found for me was being a Christian, I overcome my trials through my faith. Okay. And so it was like when I read her book and other childbirth books, there was like this connection of ideas that were coming together. And one of them was I overcome fear through faith, through the word of God and through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. And so, um, you know, in the, in the book of Genesis, it tells us that there was um, enmity put between Satan and and Eve. And I think of that as opposition. There's opposition that was put in between Eve and, um, and the adversary. And we know that the adversary is a liar from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And he walks about looking who he can devour. He's stealth, he's cunning. And it all goes back to that there are lies that tell us that we need to be afraid, that we can't give birth, and one of my favorite scriptures um, I'd like to share with you is in the book of Revelations. Mm -hmm. um, and it talks about, let's see if I can find it. I was trying to be organized within our, all of these problems we had kind of got me um, dislocated. So in Re Revelations 12, it, in 12, it talks about, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Okay. And there's a visual that I found that I just love. And I don't know if you can see this. Let me see. Whoop, can you see that? Okay. It looks like a pregnant woman. Is that Mary? Uh -huh. Pregnant woman with a demonic figure. It's a pregnant woman standing on the moon, and she's got a crown of twelve stars. And there's um, the you know Satan, a, 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 um, a what a dragon yeah. coming at her. Okay, and to me that just really um, illustrates what happens during pregnancy. During pregnancy, we are bearers of light. We are. Um, in the you know we are creators our body we're creating a, a, a being um and we are in in a place where we are have a heightened spirituality okay mm -hmm. and so because we have are in a place of heightened spirituality we have um a lot of opposition and we know that that god is our refuge god will help us through all things and i found so many scriptures like in Isaiah, I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and deliver you. And to me, that spoke to me as a pregnant woman that it, the scriptures aren't there for every other trial except for birth. Right. They're there to help us during birth too. Yeah. And we can rely on God's promises that we will have um, promptings. We will have spiritual um, promptings to help us figure out what we should do in our life, that the spirit will guide us. We will meet people that we need to know. We will find books that we need to read. If we trust him and we seek answers through God's help, he will, prov mm -hmm. he will provide those for us. And so that opened up so many things for me, so many things that I found um, and I want to share those with you. I, I think that um, in birth, we need to think of ourselves like a con you know a construction worker, uh, a carpenter. When they goes to do a job, 
he's going to have a set of tools with him to help him do his job. Yeah. And we need to have tools in our bag so that we can cope with labor. That's and right. some of those things are like um, positions in birth, using water, something called vocalizing, breathing, relaxation techniques, massage. There's like so many tools that uh, we need to know. And many times we're not informed about these. And yeah. I find that a lot of women these days don't take childbirth classes. They just go to the hospital and, and, and their thinking is, I have a labor team, my doctor and my nurses, they're gonna take care of everything and I don't need to go to a childbirth class. And I think there's also this perception that the epidural, the pain medication is what will get you through labor. And lots of times it throws women for a loop. It gives them, it messes with the hormonal signals of actually giving birth. So it, it thwarts it and it gets in the way. So there's a lot of people who say, oh, you don't have to be a hero. You don't have to go for a natural birth. Just go ahead and get, give me the epidural and I'll be fine. And what, what women find progressively after having a few kids, many will say they didn't like the epidural and what it did and the effects of the epidural. There were there are some who will say, I don't want to deal with the pain. I'm afraid of it. I'm glad I had the epidural. But um, a couple of things that you mentioned that Satan does attack us, um, those of us who believe, because a childbirth and a baby is the life force. It's the number one thing to uh, to kill and to discourage a woman to get rid of life. Uh, he also attacks marriage and family, but giving birth is difficult. And I want to just go back a little bit. What what really were you afraid of? Were you afraid that you couldn't get this big this baby out of you? You were afraid that the pain would never end. Were you afraid that you were going to die, that the baby could die? Really, we have to get to the point of what what is it that we are afraid of? That we can't do what we, that we have to do. We're not up for the task of bringing this to completion. Yeah, the fear. Well, what is I, it? Have, I have heard um, and have read stories of women who get to a point in labor where they honestly... 100% feel like they can't do it anymore and they'll turn to their spouse and they'll say, take me home. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And it's irrational, but we, um, you know, the pain becomes overwhelming and we just feel like there's, we don't know when it's going to end. Um, and so, you know, those types of things. So what I did was I built my faith. I did, um, um, I guess you can call them affirmations or belief statements. I, you know, wrote down positive things like, um, I can do this. I was designed to do this. I can overcome the pain. Um, and also I did like visualization. I would like, um, take a, a lily, a visual of a lily opening up and, and I would visualize my body opening like a lily and that's important because when we're in labor and if we feel pain we tend to want to close mm -hmm. and so we have to mentally tell ourselves that we can open and visually imagine ourselves opening so i did lots of exercises leading up to my birth um trying to you know re-teach myself how to deal with the sensations and not just um, go in there and like respond to them because you feel the pain. So I, I like to use the analogy of if, if we touch a hot stove, what do we do? We recoil. Right. Right. Cause it hurts. Yeah. yeah. So in, it, in labor, yeah. we naturally want to do the same thing. It hurts. We recoil, we tighten and all that's going to do is make it worse. Kind of like when you go to um, the doctor and they want to take blood and they go to stick you and where they tell you, relax, breathe, mm -hmm. relax your hand. Um, don't tense. Cause if you tense, it's going to hurt worse. Yeah. So it's the same principle in labor. When we feel pain, if we just react and we close off and we tense, it's going to be even worse. And then we create this fear pain cycle that we can't come out of. So I 
had to like reframe my reaction to that. Okay. And, and part of that is, as we spoke about last time also, is the environment it has to be conducive to us being able to work with our bodies and with the hormones and with the part of our nervous system that helps us to rest and digest and helps us to um, progress Mm -hmm. and works with the hormones and so by having an environment that is conducive to that then we're going to be able to go inward and listen i felt like i the the main thing was i was able to listen to what my body was telling me okay. before i was so busy recoiling and ah and tightening up me that mm -hmm. and tightening up and crying and asking other people to do stuff for me that i wasn't listening Right. I wasn't listening to my body, to my intuition, and I believe to um, my connection to um, to the spirit telling me what to do. And in 2010, there was a study that the um, the, the Lamaze organization published on in their their newsletter or their their website um, that was conducted by Lynn. Um, Clark Callister. She's a nurse researcher and she studies um, spirituality in birth. And she said um, that from the study that she had conducted, that there were themes that emerged in the study that included childbirth as a time to grow closer to God, the use of religious beliefs and rituals as powerful coping mechanisms childbirth as a time to make religiosity more meaningful, the significance of a higher power in influencing birth outcomes, and childbirth as a spiritually transforming experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we know that women tend to become more spiritual in birth. And, and so I think for me, that God wants us to become more spiritual during this time. Mm -hmm. And he's waiting to give us answers and he wants to help us. We just have to be able to, we need to listen. Okay. And we, we need to get over all of those, um, all of that training that we've had all our lives that um, women are, are crying out and, um, you know, getting mad at their husband saying, you did this to me. How many shows have yeah. we seen that? I know. Women, I Ticked My, off and did you feel that with you? Did you feel that with your first two births? It, when I was in the hospital, my first two, my first birth was um, the doctor and my husband. My labor didn't seem like it was going along quickly, but it was. And at one point, they had the TV on, and they both were looking at the TV and not paying attention to me. And I was like, you know, I felt disconnected from my husband. And the second time. The doctor said, why don't you just go downstairs and get a sandwich, you know, while I was laying there laboring and, and, you know, oh, you know, blame your husband for the pain you're in. It's so strange, but that's kind of what the and I, and I, After I read um, Laura's book, I read your book and I remember you telling that story in your book about how Bob was told, felt like. He, he could just check out. He could just go get a sandwich. He wasn't part of it. He didn't need to be there. Right. And, and I felt that way too. I was, I mean, my husband likes to share the joke um, in our family that in, during my first birth, um, they were talking and I think I probably told them like, shut up. Um, and so I, you know, I snapped at them and I kept telling them to be quiet and because what happens is when people are talking around you, it's making the part of your brain that has to focus, mm -hmm. focus on something when right. you need to be going inward and listening. So it interferes with us being able to listen when you have the chatter going on, the people talking and um, people talking to you, people talking, sharing their stories. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why um, I mean, I, we've heard women, I, I um, you know, share similar stories that mm -hmm. things were annoying to them. Yeah. And it's because we need to be concentrating. And that's our partner and our doula's job is yeah. to make sure that our environment is conducive to us being able to go inward and listen and have a connection with our higher power. 
Yes. And so this reminds me in talking about your partner, what is your partner's role in this? And even before the labor begins, while you're pregnant, you can talk to your partner and try to learn. If you haven't given birth yet, you might not know that there will be a time that labor requires you to just go into your own zone. And I don't think women really know that. They just know, how am I going to deal with this pain? We're going to go to the hospital or we're just going to be guided along. But they don't know what does it take for you to go into that zone. And that's where athletes might have a little uh, advantage. They visualize. They work toward the goal. They, they reach the endorphin, the high level. But here's the thing. I think that women can tell their husbands what they want, might want of them. And the, the partner or the husband can just go along with what she wants to do. We hear of many situations where the husband wants to be directive. He doesn't want the wife, he doesn't want to see the wife suffer, doesn't want to see her in pain. And so he might suggest to her what she can do. But the couple can kind of work towards take the cues from the laboring mom and just be there. Maybe a little back rub, just being quiet, maybe holding her hand, just being there comforting to make the environment like you said comfortable so that's so i think that the husband can take the cues from the wife would be a good thing when she's in labor and one other thing i wanted to mention about the environment and laura shanley talks about this and not many other um authors talk about this is the word shame shame and embarrassment imagine you're in the hospital you have the hospital gown on and your legs are wide open for people to look at you might feel ashamed or embarrassed and it really is a private event going on and you could feel shameful and that's going to mess with the unfolding of your labor so what what can you speak about shame or embarrassment in, in giving birth well i wanted to finish sharing on this um this quote that i had um from the Maz international all right. It says, it's important to acknowledge the inherently spiritual nature of childbirth and create a birth environment that lets women give birth simply and safely. A key component to creating this env environment is avoiding unnecessary medical interventions. Okay. And that was issued by Lamaze, the Lamaze International in 2010. So, um, so you and I came to the belief that the best place for us to to bear our children and to be able to do what we needed to do and have a spiritual connection. I know that was my choice. Um, um, and to be able to birth un, 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 unhindered yeah. was to do it at home. And so for you and I, we felt like that was the best way to um, keep our modesty and to have a um, unifying um, experience with our spouse, our husbands, and our family. Yeah. But uh, women can't achieve that in the hospital yeah. or at a birth center. But we do know that there are women who have had um, sexual, um, um, what do I say? Sexual, um, not experiences, but. Yeah. Um, uh, they've been they've been violated violated, violated. violated. yeah and violated sexually and have post traumatic stress and the and birth can trigger those feelings yeah so a woman who has had those experiences needs to address them before labor okay and communicate those things with their provider okay. and have people with them that will help them to be safe and that's one of the reasons why in our last episode, our last discussion, we had talked about uh, the woman who was in the triage room by herself okay. without her husband, and she left and went home, ended up having an unassisted birth at home. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that was um, COVID and the miscommunication, her thinking her husband wasn't going to be able to be with her at all. But, um, you know, that time when she was alone and by herself, that could be very detrimental to a woman. Yeah. So. You know, we need to make sure that's why having a doula can be so important because you establish a relationship with a doula ahead of time. Nurses and the doctors or the midwives, they're going to come and go. They have other patients to take care of. 
but your doula will be with you the whole time and give you like a lifeline, someone that you trust who's there for you. In addition to your spouse or your partner or your significant other, they don't take away from that role. They can add to it. And they're there for both of you, the, the laboring woman and the father or the partner. Okay. Um, and so that was one of the things that helped me during my second birth to have, um, to cope with labor was having a doula with me. All right. Let me ask I, you a question. All right. For those of those people who are watching this, how can people find a doula in their area and what is the general cost? And is a doula someone they meet with while they're pregnant and then who shows up with them at their birth? Well, a doula can't, uh, okay. Studies show that having a continuous labor support person with you um, is helpful and that can be a family member. Okay. Unfortunately, most family members, are in, in the dark about birth as much as a laboring woman can be if she hasn't studied. And, and you know, I studied with my first two and I still had stuff I didn't know. And a doula knew more than I did. Um, so you can have a family member, but if that family member is, is afraid and inexperienced as you are, then they may not be the best one. So if you want to hire a professional doula, someone who has experience and knowledge and has studied birth and has attended births, then you can look online. Um, they have like um, a registry where you can put in like your zip code and find doulas in your, in your area within an, an hour away. However, you can, you know, get on Facebook pages and ask if anybody has a doula. Um, but like where I live, there's doulas of um, Kansas City. They have a page that you, a website you can go to and look through and read their profiles and see which one would appear to, um, you know, be the best fit for you. And then, of course, you would want to meet with them, interview with them. And then, you know, ideally you would meet with a couple of doulas yeah. or at least talk to them on the phone to see which one would be the best fit for you. And okay. doulas, you know, I don't know. Um, the price of a doula would change depending on location. I would think from a couple of hundred dollars up to hundreds of dollars um, depends. I know when I was acting as a doula, I included photography in my services. And I think I was offering like, I don't know, 300, $300, yeah. um, uh, maybe more three to 500. But um, in some places, Medicaid will cover a doula. Huh. Um, some hospitals, I know, you know, 20 years or, or 15 years ago, there were hospitals that would provide a doula. I don't know how common that is. I think that's probably on the coasts where it's, you know, doulas are more common. But OK. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Let me see what I, I, I jotted a few notes. How to cope with labor. I believe that you prepare for labor during your pregnancy and that a lot of it is mindset. What are you setting yourself up for? And that when labor comes to you, it's not just physical. A lot of people are focused on the physical, what's happening. But you focused on spiritual. And I was focusing on the biological, physiological, nat um, natural, plus psychological, the mindset. Was I positive? What did, what did I expect? What was I expecting? And I always expected something quick healthy and it could be painful. I, I never had the conception. This is going to be unbearably painful. I knew that the contractions would come on and they would be strong and they probably could involve pain, but I, I didn't think that it was going to last a long time. So I don't think I had fear that some women do fear of pain. I, I, I really focused on my mindset and I prepared for it. And um, the anticipation was positive. Wow, this is exciting. This is going to happen within 24 hours. You know, a, a baby, we will get to meet the baby. So, and also what you said, you, you pulled up, um, you looked upon help from, from God and spiritually. And, and there were times where I thought, 
okay, millions of women have gone before me and done this before me. It's going to happen for me, and I'm just going to be another one that's going to give birth. So that was very helpful. And then at a couple of my births, I had five strong women in mind, and Laura, Martha, Louise, maybe Nicole, uh, Augustine. I had I had other women who were like, wow, they just, Valerie, they gave birth very simply, yet strongly, yet beautifully. So I just knew I could do it. If they could do it, I could do it. That's kind of, is. are those some of the thoughts that you thought of during labor? If other women can do it, I can do it. Well, you said something a while ago that um, connects with one of my thoughts, is I prepared for labor like an athlete. Yeah. I think we need to think of it as the Olympics of our life. And yeah. athletes prepare physically, um, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. They yeah. attack it from all angles and they, uh, they eat, you know, they eat and drink well. Women need to stay hydrated. Our diet can affect our labor. Hydration can affect it. Making sure we're getting plenty of fats, like um, through eating avocados and nuts, essential fats. Um, those can help to uh, nurture our tissues so they're nice and supple. And that way we can, um, it will help with our contractions and also help to prevent tearing. Um, so diet um, and and drink and staying hydrated is important. Exercising, I gardened, I walked, I was active, I did exercises, stretching exercises. Um, so mm -hmm. I kept my strength physically. I went hiking when I was in labor and every single one of my labors, let's see, one of them, I was actually on skates. I probably don't recommend it. But I went <laughs> skating the day I was in labor. I took my daughter skating and I got on skates and went around a few times with my kids. Um, one of them, we went hiking up in the flat irons in Colorado early in labor. Um, when I was pregnant with my, my six, I walked with the kids to the park and I was pretty, pretty early labor. I was having contractions and on the way back, I was like, oh man, I hope my husband comes and picks us up. <laughs> I wasn't sure how I was going to make it all the way home. But so yeah. I was very active all through my pregnancies, even during labor. So that was very important. Um, I already talked about spiritually. Um, you know, one of the scriptures that is was important to me is, uh, I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. As, I think it says, as a man, as a man thinketh, so shall he be, or as a woman thinketh. And, um, you know, so that was important because yes, what we think is what we are. And if we think about it, women all through time have been giving birth. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you study birth that, you know, people say, oh, women died in the old days and babies died. Yes, they did. But many times it was because of malnutrition, unsanitary conditions, lacking um, running water, you know, basics. There's basic things that we've learned about hygiene and being having the things that we need available to us that have improved uh, the situation so that those things don't kill us anymore in labor. Mm -hmm. And so women have been birthing all through time. And most, if you study the numbers, most women are going to give birth without complication. Right. So believing that all the women before us have given birth and that we can do it too is very important. So, um, you know, it's a mental game. Athletes prepare mentally. And so that's why the visualizations and the affirmations and um, listening to other women's stories who have had positive birth experiences is very important because then that helps you. Like you said, you just named all these women who have had great experiences. Yeah. Some women don't know any women who have. And so I spent many hours online looking up birth experiences and that's one of the benefits of the internet is that we can find positive experiences and we can connect with other women and have um you know create a, a society for ourselves um of other women who've had positive birth experiences and we don't have to just listen to the negative experiences not that there's not a place for those yes there's a place you know yes 
women are going to, even we can do all we can, and it doesn't mean we're going to be guaranteed to have the birth experience we want. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't mean, you know, me, when I had my home births, I was listening the whole time, trying to figure out, is this normal? Is this not normal? And I would get the sensation of, no, it's going to be okay. This is normal. And one, with one of our births, I had a lull after transition. Labor just stopped for like half hour. And wow. in all my reading, I had never, had never read about that yet. That after transition, God gives you a, a rest. There's like a rest time where a woman can sit and chat and talk and not have any contractions. And then it'll pick up again. And then you finish and you have crowning and you deliver the baby. So I was sitting there and I wasn't sure what was going on. And uh, the midwife wasn't comfortable with it, but I was, and I felt peace. Um, mm -hmm. This was at our third birth. We had a midwife there. Yeah. And it wasn't until later that I read that I remember I read, uh, what was it? Um, Ani Lee Logan. She was a black uh, midwife in the South and mm -hmm. she had attended hundreds of births and had stellar outcomes. And she was a God fearing woman. And she, she said that, you know, God gives a woman um, a break, basically. Interesting. That, that I want to say something. I want to speak to that because I think it's really important. I hear many stories of women who pushed for two hours. I pushed for four hours. I pushed for hours. I'm wondering if that woman entered what you entered, a period of rest, but the caregivers and the medical team around her, just because they knew biologically she was ready to push, they kept telling her to keep pushing when maybe she didn't need to push, maybe, but maybe there was fear that the baby could suffocate or, or die in there, or you know, you're almost getting the baby out. So I'm wondering if, if, if these women are given a reprieve sort of, and, and everybody around them is sort of coaching them to push because I, I can't relate to the long endurance that is needed. I didn't have to really have long endurance and some people do. And so that's very interesting. Thank you for mentioning that little well, detail because people well, watching will know that maybe they too will have a lull and it doesn't mean you should keep push, push, push and get the baby out. Well, we know that even recently the um, ACOG is uh, becoming more aware that we don't have that we don't need the 24 hour time limit. We don't need to give birth within 24 hours. And of so the there's this breaking. Yeah. Yes. There's this push that um, there's a push that labor can go on longer than previously thought. Mm -hmm. Good. And that caregivers need to not be on the clock and expecting us to deliver within a certain time frame. Yeah. So, um, you know, that it can go on for some. My labors were all about 12 hours mm -hmm. from beginning to end. And that includes early labor when I was able to go walk to the park and go hiking and do all those things and okay. until, um, you know, and then you get to hard labor. And of course, it wasn't walking around the park then. But, um, you know, so that that we don't have to be on the clock. And yes, our bodies can. We can have a lull and we can have a rest and it's natural. And then labor will pick up again. And so, um, you know, one of the things that you had mentioned earlier about the husband not knowing when to be involved with the woman. Yes. Because it's hard to communicate. Okay. And it's, and, 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 you know, especially with your first time, that's why having a doula is so great the first time, because we really don't know what to expect. And it's really nice to have an experienced woman with you saying, this is natural. You, this is normal. You're what you're going through is normal. And guess what? You're almost at the end. And many women don't realize, especially with your first birth, when the sensations start to become, when your contractions get very close and become more powerful, mm -hmm. that is when you're nearing the end and it means you're almost done. Yeah. And so when you get to that point and women think, Oh my gosh, I can't go through this forever. And they don't know you're almost at the end. Yeah. If you have a doula there, then she can tell you, this is natural, you're almost done. And the husband might be there going, oh no, I don't know what to do. And the woman's saying, I can't do this anymore. And the husband thinks, 
see that see our our men they want to be our knight in shining armor they want to be there for us they want to know how to help us and if they haven't been taught then their reaction is do something for her give her something right. help her get her and out. so you know so if you take a childbirth class usually this they'll say um the woman should be the one to request it the doula doesn't suggest it the husband shouldn't suggest it the woman should be the one to ask for the pain medication because if she's in the point of labor where it's getting tough and somebody says do you want pain medication she's more likely to say sure even if she would have gone longer without it had it not been suggested okay so the woman should be the one to ask for it okay but so you know so when I got to that point, that's where the whole, you know, listening comes into play. One of the, I'll, I'm going to kind of go to a different topic. Okay. So one of the things at my third birth, it was my first home birth. Okay. And I was, had gone past early labor and I was in um, hard labor or, or it wasn't early labor. It wasn't hard labor. It was just getting a little more serious. And I went downstairs, I had prepared, you know, dot, done all my preparations. And now I was at the point where I needed to focus. Okay. So what, what does the woman do when she's in labor? You go and lay down in your bed, right? If you're so not feeling massive contractions, if you're not, if you're not like pulled over by, by massive contractions, I think you can lay down and rest. Sometimes you just sit and freeze and, because it's painful. And, in early labor, it, it is good to rest. You don't want to do too much activity because you can wear yourself out. It is good to take a nap. Um, but when you get a little more in active labor, yeah. then, so this is what happened. I got in, it was a little more active labor, mm -hmm. and I went to go lay in the bed. As we've all seen on TV, and then we've all been taught, that's what laboring women do, is get in a bed. And yeah. I laid in that bed, and I got a contraction. And for the first time since I had started having contractions that day, I went out. That hurt. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh, it didn't hurt before I got in the bed. It hurt when I got in the bed. So I'm getting out of the bed. I see. So I got out of the bed during my third labor and I never went back to bed for all my other labors after that. Okay. So I went, what I did was I stood at the end of my bed and I put pillows, I stacked them up and I stood on them. And I stood and I, I leaned on the pillows and I swayed my hips Yeah. during all the contraction. What does this do? This works with gravity. It helps open your pelvis. It helps you to progress. It relieves the pain. So I stood there and I swayed and then I would listen to my body. And guess what? I believe pain is our body's way of telling us we need to do something different. Very so good. when I was standing in that position and I was feeling great. And then after a little bit, I got another ow feeling. I thought, okay, I need to do something else. What do I need to do? So I'm listening to my body. I need to go on hands and knees or I need to go for a walk or, okay, now I need to get in the bathtub. You don't want to take a bath. You don't want to get in the bath early in labor, it can stall your labor. A shower is great early in labor. So you can shower. But I found when you're in active labor, I always got to a certain point where I knew the only thing that was going to help bring my pain back to controllable level was by getting in a bath of hot water. So I would go into the hot water. And that, unfortunately, is the, one of the number one reasons why I stopped going to a hospital for birth because they do not provide you a tub to um, maybe not give birth in, but to labor in. Mm -hmm. So um, if I was going to go and give birth in a hospital, I would make sure that I went to a hospital where there was water available. And if you're not able to get that, a shower can help. Also staying at home and laboring as long as you can, yeah. can help. And then transferring to the hospital so for me getting in a hot tub it does wonders mm -hmm. the the water is not like, too hot isn't there a dangerous isn't there a dangerous level yeah. i mean you yeah, say hot. you're going to use common sense with comfort you're going to use common yeah. sense with what's temperatures you're, you're also you're not going to make it too hot you're not going to be in there 
too long either. But right. one of the things that Ani Lee Logan said also is, um, you know, that's also God's um, natural anesthesia or a- natural pain reliever is uh, water. Um, yeah. You know, water is, women have been going to water all through time for labor. It's, it's so beneficial. And what it does, think about it. It's going to relax your tissues, your ligaments. It mm-hmm. helps you to, um, you know, you're, you're expanding. Your pelvis is expanding all through labor. And that water is going to help you to expand. And what it does is once you, the, when you get in the tub at the first, everything stops. It kind of labor, you get a break. It stops mm-hmm. it. And you can relax for a little while. And then the contractions will come back. And for a while, you'll be good. And the tub will be helping. And you have to be listening. Because then you're going to get to a point where your body's going to tell you, okay, we need to do something else now. Yeah. And for, you know, there's also something that Michelle O'Donnell, he's an obstetrician, and he wrote about that there is a reflex too, that we have to watch out for many times if we're in a tub and we go to get out that can trigger birth. And so, um, it can, I've had it. We're ready. <laughs> Be ready for the baby to come out. Whoa. Yes. Cause you exactly. were so relaxed because you were so relaxed. I want to talk about, um, first I want to welcome Sheila Stubbs and Martha to the call. Hi, and Hi, I, Martha. Sheila wrote, this was probably 15 minutes ago, keeping busy and active in labor kept your mind positive. But I want, we, we should probably take a couple of minutes. There are many women who give birth via C-section their first baby, or they'll give birth and it was highly medicalized. They, they were maybe induced at 38, 39 weeks, induced, they had an epidural. So some women have subsequent pregnancies and they don't really know what the physiological signs of labor are. So I think that adds an element of fear. I've never labored before. I've had a a C-section or two. And so there's more fear and maybe a tightness and a withholding. And sometimes women aren't ready to become mothers. They're just, they're hanging on to the pregnancy. They've got the nice attention for being pregnant. Maybe they glowed. So maybe we can take a couple of minutes. Maybe Sheila has a couple of things to type in. When you've had a C-section, how do you get your mindset to change to letting the natural prevail, whereas in the past you've had a medical birth? So that's well, I think a mind I, shift. I think, yes, it would be harder for a woman who's had a cesarean because you also have that added um, fear of rupture that we know is a small risk, but I think it's the same thing. A first time mom isn't gonna know the natural course of labor. It's the same thing. You read birth stories, you have to have faith. You look to other women who've gone through it. Um, you have a doula. Uh, you're, you're gonna need the same things as any other first time mom, I think. Yeah. You just are gonna, it might just be a little more challenging. You're gonna need some additional support uh, and being involved with like a VBAC community. Now, I'd like to share one other thing that has that helped me and made a huge difference in labor because I know we're getting to the end of our time. Yeah, what was that? And, and that is vocalizing. Mm-hmm. So there's a scripture in Isaiah um, 42, 13 to 14. And it talks about... Um, a woman who, oh, sorry, I should have had this up. Isaiah, um, what did I say? 42? 42, yeah. Oh, sorry. 13, 14. Um, this is a very powerful scripture that really changed my births. Um, it says, the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry. Yea, roar, he shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrain myself. Now I will cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. Powerful. Powerful. (laughs) Woman has to have power. She's about to give birth. You have to claim and accept your power that you are given. And, And don't let anybody take that away from you. Women have lost their victory cry. 
when I when I read that scripture, I thought of you know what is I was trying to think of the name of that movie last night, and I forgot to look it up in, before our conversation today. Remember what is it? Um, it was Mel Gibson, and um, he was some kind of like maybe Irish or Scottish warrior, and there was like clan fighting. I don't I know forget the name of the movie. Anyhow, so I there was I had, I never saw the movie, but I saw a commercial, and there was this line of men in um you know they were like scottish or something and they were wearing all of their fighting warrior gear and um mel gibson was in the front and they were on the other side was the enemy okay so there was two lines of men and the warriors were there and he was the leader and how did they start their fight he went Rawr! okay okay he roared yeah. and, he made this, ah! and it was this powerful victory cry and yeah. then they all they all did it and they all ran ahead to go do their war and women need to have a victory cry i was a little girl crying saying help me and then i became this woman who had a victory cry i was strong and i was powerful and i was in control that's a hard word to use in labor because the way you become in control is by releasing you have to release to it you don't control it by, um, you know, there's, it, it, it's, it's, there's a difference. You yeah. control it by giving up to it, not yeah. fighting it. Okay? Good. Very good. And part, part of that is through the victory cry, through vocalizing. So what vocalizing is, some women do it differently than others. Some women can sing through labor, um, and that can be vocalizing. Some women can say a word or a sound. I chose a sound. Mm -hmm. So vocalizing goes like this and this is an important concept i actually taught a, a couple um my childbirth class my gave them all my tips and suggestions and was telling them about vocalizing and the husband said wow this is really powerful because my corporation paid for us to go to a session where we learned about vocalizing <laughs> because it de-stresses it helps to prevent stress Mm -hmm. And so he was so excited because, you know, he, they had paid for him to go, go through this. And he knew that it was, it was, um, um, proven. Yeah. And so vocalizing is, it goes along with deep breathing. Okay. When you think about an animal in labor, they're going to breathe deeply and naturally. And that's why I don't encourage the Lamazes he, he, who breathing. I hyperventilated with that. One of the risks with that is increased risk of hyperventilation. So mm -hmm. natural breathing is a deep breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. And it, so the it, way it my, oxygen to the brain and to the around, it circulates in the body, a big and full. If, and if you learn about breathing, you're oxygenating your tissues, you're helping to relieve lactic acid. Lactic acid is a byproduct of um, the tissues um, having contractions and you build up this lactic acid in the cells. So breathing deeply helps to oxygenate the cells, helps to get rid of that. Also staying hydrated in labor is important yeah. and that helps to clean the lactic acid out also. So breathing is, is relaxing. Now, this is how my husband knew it was time for him to stop whatever he was doing to come help me. Okay. And the way he would come help me is because I, as I said, I was never laying down in labor. I was always either on my hands and knees standing. I would sit. Um, I found sitting like at the foot of the couch or the recliner on blankets. That was helpful. But usually I was um, in a position where he could access my back and he could provide counter pressure. And that helps during contraction, especially if you have low um, um, pain in the lower back. So he would know because there I was breathing in my zone and the contraction would get to a point where I would vocalize and I would give off a sound. I would go. Uh, uh, Now with vocalizing, you want to stay low. If it's resonating in your lungs and it's low, it's going to be more conducive than a high ah, or screaming, I can't do this. Help me. Somebody get the baby out of me. 
okay? Yeah. So vocalizing, it, it's kind of like, those are my dogs. I hear your dog vocalizing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in labor, when you vocalize, it helps you to go, hold on, I'm going to go let them out real quick. All right, all right. So while she's going to tend to her dogs, I'll read a couple of the comments from Sheila, who did have a C-section who went on to several home births. Sheila says, it's not unusual for VBAC moms to labor very slowly, whether it's physically or emotionally, a way to gently test oneself to assure yourself, my body can, I can. So, so the C-section woman might have a slower labor. She's, she's easing herself into it. And she says, the vocalizing, Sheila says, the vocalizing scares doctors because it sounds like severe pain, but it may be just because it's so intense, like when we scream on a roller coaster. So, so there are... It's, it's gaining confidence in yourself. It's gaining confidence. And one other thing related, oh, the vocalizing, if you vocalize first, good things will follow after. It's almost like you're setting yourself up for the consequences you want. You're vocalizing, you're, you're talking the baby out or you're singing the baby out. And so some, women, some women will say, baby, mm -hmm. baby, mm -hmm. or Jesus, or you know, any word you want, honey, yeah, or sing, yeah, but it's not screaming. If you you hear, uh, that's not screaming, it's not, yeah. And you know, so one of the things that I do as a doula is I will vocalize with the woman, yeah, so she's not the only one in the room vocalizing, right? Why? Good. Because if you're in the hospital, yes. yes. All right. So Cambry writes, what do you guys think of red raspberry leaf tea? Also, when should you start drinking if you do like it and find it beneficial? I can't answer that question, Cambry, but I'm going to have Jody McLaughlin on on Wednesday and we could talk about red raspberry leaf tea. Um, Cambry. So sorry. Cambry asked about red raspberry leaf tea during labor. I can't answer that, um, but I do know somebody who can answer it for us on Wednesday. And um, there's one thing I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about this issue of, of being uninhibited in labor. When we're in the hospital, most of the time we'll have a hospital gown on and our lower body is exposed and that's what they focus on in giving birth. When I was at home, my two times, I found that I was working up a sweat. And so I was happier to be naked. And I know you talk about the word modest. This idea of modesty, shame, embarrassment in the hospital might interfere with you being powerful, uninhibited, what it really takes to give birth. And, and you might not, you know, you hold back. And, and sometimes in birth photography, women are closed up on the top you know they're they're concerned with the photography and not being immodest but you'll find that many women will just want to be primitive and naked you're, you're hot it's it's a big job that you're doing so it's best at home and and being sensual and sexual and actually when you're vocalizing it does sound orgasmic many births will sound or natural births you will hear Oh, you know, like, like an orgasmic release. And that can be embarrassing. And some doctors and nurses might not hear that too often. If the woman's medicated, maybe in a, a less than 5% of their births, will they hear those like orgasmic moans when the baby's being born? And that's really hard to do in certain environments, right? Yes, it is. And, you know, so, so when I, when I vocalize with a woman, it's because you're in an environment and that's not your home and you can feel self-conscious. And so if I vocalize with the woman, at least in the beginning, then it can help her overcome that little bit of feeling self-conscious mm -hmm. um, and help the staff to know that this is natural. Now, this is also something you want to talk about with your provider beforehand and, you know, and and discuss it with them so you can see, are they a provider? 
that understands that women make noises in labor and that that's not a sign that they, she needs an epidural. Right. And, you know, yeah. so you need to, to discuss these things ahead of time because, um, because yes, not all providers will have had experience with a woman in true natural labor. And mm -hmm. so you picking out your provider is one of the key things you need to do. And so that's why you and I chose to birth at home because we knew that in home, we can, in our own home, we can do whatever we want and we don't have to worry about anybody else what they think about what we're doing and making a judgment on what we're doing. Right. And so my husband would hear me vocalizing and he knew it was time for him to come and take his position um, doing counter pressure and um, that it was serious business. And I was, so I wanted to finish what I was saying before my dog started barking. I think of it, it's like a, riding a wave. You start to vocalize and it takes you up over the wave to the other side mm -hmm. and it gets you, you have to go through labor one contraction at a time. That's it. That's all you need to remind yourself. I just need to deal with one contraction at a time. Mm -hmm. And if you can get through that one, then guess what? You can get through the next one. And so that vocalizing just helps you ride the wave to the next one. And, and one of the things I think was Ina Mae said was this is just a sensation that takes my concentration. Oh, very good. Uh -huh. yeah. And so, you know, in labor, we do have to deal um, with the whole, um, you know, sensuality, modesty, whatever we're bearing ourselves. You get to a point in labor where you really don't care, most women. Correct. And so mm -hmm. a lot of women know they're going to get to that point where they don't care. And so they want to give birth at home because they want, they know that they want to protect their, um, their, their space and to be able to do whatever they want. But, you know, so Michelle O'Don states, um, he encourages that there are no, um, um, but, um, what's the word observers at birth okay. that anybody who's not involved in the labor with the woman is an observer and they are taking away from her energy. They're um, making like a conflict. And so you might want to rethink having the photographer there or your mom and your sister and your whoever to be sitting there all watching you. So the more people you have in the room watching you, the more chance it's going to complicate your birth. So, maybe have uh, you know birth photography is beautiful i've done it myself um i love taking pictures of women in labor but for my own labors i came to a point where um we had videotaped my first birth and then later on i i didn't want my mom there videotaping and it was just my husband and i and yeah. we took pictures afterward um i also um just wore like a like a sports bra so that I could take everything off and I would have a sports bra uh, when I was in the hospital that way I could, uh, but you know, I think I probably threw that off too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I don't have to worry about that at home. And, right, right. You know, your kids can come in. My dog was there My after Danielle was born. Our dog came in and he sniffed her. He's like, oh, what is this? And then he left. Um, you know, you just have a freedom at home that you don't have in the hospital. But if you want that freedom in the hospital, then you need to communicate with your providers to make sure that they know what natural is. What is their natural childbirth rate? Great. How many of their women, of their moms have a natural childbirth? Yep. You probably Great. don't want to go to one who doesn't have a high rate. Right. Very, very good topics. I'm sure there's more we could talk about, but we've been talking about how to cope with labor with Susan Fierro Bake, a mother of seven, a nurse, a photographer, a very kind friend, a uh, creative person. I, I've enjoyed it, Susan. And you gave so many good pointers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate it. I'm sorry about all the disruptions no, no, um, no, normal I'm life. glad we were able to work through the technical difficulties yep. and find a way to have this conversation i think what you're doing is awesome i love all the conversations you're you're having you know this whole covid it you know really puts in the forefront of my mind something that was already in the forefront but even more so now as the age that you and i are in you are a little bit older than me but still mm -hmm. i'm past the, the, the mommying baby stage. I'm um, post I'm postmenopausal now. I'm, I'm getting older. I'm a grandma. 
And so I really think about my legacy that is so important to me. Um, so much of what I do in life is um, wanting to leave a legacy for my children, a rich legacy. I want them to know what my thoughts were and my dreams and what was important to me. And so many times, you know, I find that I don't talk about all the things I know with my kids. Yeah. And so this conversation is great because one day they might, you know, look at this and learn. It's so important for us to share with our daughters and help them to be able to have, um, you know, great births and give them the information that we've have. I've studied so much. There's so much in here and mm -hmm. I need to make sure that I share it vocally and also that I write it out. And so I just appreciate this opportunity to share the things that I've learned that made a difference for my births and hopefully they'll benefit somebody else. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been fantastic. You're fantastic. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Bye. <laughs> bye.